Good. All right, so uh, let us start. And today we are happy to have Harold Williams from USC. And the title is Differential Operators on the Base Affine Space, in this case, SLN slash mod unipotent and quantized coolant branch. So, Harold, please. Great. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to be in this seminar. Uh, so I'll talk about some joint work with uh, Tom Gannon, who's currently a postdoc at UCLA. Uh, and the talk will be a mix of a kind of very classical topic and a more modern topic. The classical topic is the base affine space of a reductive group and its algebra of differential operators. And then the more modern topic will be the theory of Coulomb branches uh, of 3D n equals 4 gauge theories and their quantizations. So I'll say a little bit of background on the former, then some background on the latter, and then I'll state some results that relate the two. All right, <clears throat> so to start with the base affine space, just to fix our lead theory notation, so let's let G be a simple algebraic group. All right, B for a Borel, U for its unipotent radical, and T for its maximal torus. At some point, we'll just specialize to the case of G as SLN, and then of course B is upper triangular matrices, U will be upper triangular matrices, ones on the diagonal, and then T is the diagonal matrices. Um, but given a general such G, the base affine space of G is just this quotient of G uh, under multiplication by this uh, uh, maximal unipotent. Uh, so the first thing to say is that, uh, so despite its name, so it's a quasi-affine variety. So the map from G mod U to spec of the ring of regular functions on G mod U is an open immersion. So with that in mind, we'll just write G mod U bar for this, um, for this affine variety. Uh, the multiplication action, where it's GX on itself by left and right multiplication, that descends to an action of G by T on G mod U. Uh, and maybe, so G mod U is a classical fundamental object in Lie theory. And maybe the most kind of elementary fact that illustrates why that should be is that when I take the coordinate ring of G mod U, so of course G acts on G mod U, so it acts on its coordinate ring. And when I decompose uh, C of G mod U into irreducible G representations, we find that we just get the direct sum of all of the simple irreducible G representations. Without so, multiplicity. Without multiplicity, that's right. So from a kind of reverse point of view, you might think, well, we take all of the irreducible representations, uh, take the direct sum of all of them appearing one time, that's a completely canonical representation of the group. And now we're finding that we're observing that there's a completely canonical ring structure on that um, canonical G representation. And of course, if I take now the T action on the other side, well, taking the quotient by that T action realizes uh, G mod U as a torus bundle over the flag variety G mod B, which of course is a projective variety. So another kind of informal description of G mod U is it's a kind of quasi-affine approximation to the full flag variety G mod B. So just to talk through um, how all of these uh, things fit together in the simplest case when G is just SL2. So in that case, the simple SL2 reps um, up to isomorphism are just the different symmetric powers of C2. And of course, the direct sum of those is obviously a ring. It's the symmetric algebra of C2. So at the affine closure of SL2 mod U, that's just going to be C2 itself, or maybe the dual C2. Um, and then if you work through it, you find that SL2 mod U is just the complement of the origin in C2. And then in particular, of course, it's the maximal torus of SL2 with C star, and then the quotient of C2 mod minus the origin by C star, of course, is P1, which is the flag variety for SL2. Yeah, maybe for graduate students, uh, 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 as a homework, you can check that indeed a uh, regular function of C square minus one point is the same as, as functions on the whole C square. This is why it's symmetrical. Excellent, yes. Um, and the only, so here's the simplest example. The, the one thing that is really kind of fundamentally misleading about this example is that in fact, um, SL2 is the only case where this affine closure is smooth. So of course, G mod U itself will always be smooth, but in general, the, the comp, its complement in the affine closure will have some complicated and interesting singularities. So this is the kind of 
one quirk of this SL2 case. All right, so there's um, the base affine space, and we've talked about its ring of regular functions and of equal or greater interest is its uh, ring of differential operators. Carl, um, uh, uh, I have kind of question this age bar. Uh, uh, yeah, so. Yeah, yeah. You know. it, yeah, thank you. So we'll be more precisely throughout, I'll work with this asymptotic version. So the usual al algebra of differential operators has a filtration. So really I'm talking about the Reese algebra of that, of D of G mod U as a filtered algebra. Um, that parameter H bar will be natural in the, in the theorems that we state later. So if I specialize H bar to be equal to one, then I'll have the, the usual algebra of differential operators. And if I set it to be zero, then I'll have the coordinate ring of the in the affine closure of the cotangent bundle of G mod U. Um, so this ring of differential operators, again, this is a very classical fundamental topic in representation theory. So for example, it was studied in, uh, in detail in the famous work of Bernstein, Gelfand, and Gelfand from 75, the paper that introduces what were later called the BGG resolutions. And also at you know, G mod U, we said it's a very close counterpart to G mod B. Of course, differential operators on G mod B play a, a fundamental role in representation theory via valence and Bernstein localization. And in fact, certain you can prove uh, valence and Bernstein localization in ways that appeal that pass through differential operators on G mod U. So this algebra, you know, it's deeply connected to the representation of the Lie algebra G uh, via this connection to the flag variety. Uh, another very interesting feature of this algebra is that there's a, an action of the vial group uh, on D of G mod U. And this was first introduced by Gelfand and Grayev. Um, it's kind of a, a, a hidden symmetry because it, it doesn't come from an action of the vial group. Of course, if I have automorph, if I have a group acting on G mod U, like we discussed on the previous side, uh, those lift to an, to an action uh, on this ring of differential operators. But this vial group symmetry is, is kind of, a, you only see it once you pass to differential operators. So for example, in this SL2 case, so now the algebra of differential operators, well, this is just differential operators on C2. So I take the tensor algebra on X coordinate functions X and Y, their partial derivatives, and now this, again, this variable H bar, and then we impose the standard calculus relations with H bar playing the, you know, the role of here, say the commutator of partial X and X will be equal to H bar. And this algebra has uh, an involutive automorphism given by taking the Fourier transform. So if I permute, if I swap X and partial Y and I swap Y with minus partial X, um, that's an involution of this algebra. Uh, and in general, the kind of, uh, generators of this, so in this vial group symmetry that we have for general G, it's generated be, via similar kinds of operations that there's for any G, a collection of partial Fourier transforms associated with simple roots. Um, but it, it's not at all obvious in, you know, from the description of the generators that they're going to satisfy vial group relations in general. So that's mm -hmm. been an interesting kind of topic throughout the literature on the subject and even in the past few years was studied in uh, 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 in great TTL and work of Ginsburg and Kajdan. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and what's uh, what's kind of uh, the, the easiest way to show the braid group relation? Yeah. Um, probably not. I, I think it, it originally the proof is kind of analytic in nature. If you look at the original proofs, as I alluded to this ginsburg Kajdan paper, their main result let's see if I can remember correctly offhand, it's something like you realize this algebra as differential operators for the Whitaker reduction uh, tensor with uh, the Carton, with um, a Carton factor over the center of the enveloping algebra. And then you take invariance for the center. But the point is in that, so they construct that isomorphism. And once you have that kind of isomorphism, then you have the vial group action on that Carton factor. And that gives a purely algebraic construction of this. Um, uh, but it, it, it's still not uh, trivial. Uh, and in, and I, I think a nice feature of the, you know, the result that we'll get to a little later is that the this Gelfand-Greiv action will be, will write some kind of isomorphism involving a Coulomb branch. 
And on the Coulomb side, the symmetrical action will be completely kind of manifest from the beginning. Um, mm, okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's see. All right. So there's, I think that's everything I wanted to say for the base that finds base. Um, all right. So now let's move on to Coulomb branches. So Coulomb branches, these are uh, certain geometric objects associated to supersymmetric quantum field theories um, on non-compact spacetimes. The case of relevance for us will be the case where I have T is a, a 3D N equals 4 QFT. And associated with that, uh, we have a geometric object called its Coulomb branch, which I'll write as M sub C of T. Uh, and the physical interpretation of these spaces won't be so directly re relevant to us, but just to say a few words, the, the point is that this space, it, it's a space which parametrizes certain vacua of the theory. And this is these are the kind of data that one needs to make sense of expectation values of various operators on, on a non-compact space, in this case on R3. Uh, from our point of view, the what kind of geometric object um, is this? It, uh, uh, we'll consider it as a complex affine variety, which in particular has a natural quantization. So its uh, algebra of functions has a, a deformation, which I'll write again, C sub H bar. Well, well you, you forgot probably to say that it should have some Poisson structure, otherwise. I, indeed, so in particular, so actually in the, you know, in the BFN framework that we'll describe in a second, the thing that is kind of more that you get first is the quant is the deformation. Uh, but in particular, from this deformation, it induces a Poisson structure on the underlying variety, which will be generically symplectic. Um, it'll be a singular variety, typically. Um, and another kind of structure in the background, also this will be, a, in fact, a hyperkähler variety, though the hyperkähler structure is not something that we'll think about or will even be kind of directly accessible in the re realization we'll work with. Is, is it a, a fact or expectation from physics that it's hyperkähler? BFN construction is pure algebra geometric. That's right. I would yeah, I would say it's a uh, it's physically an expectation, which is not a fact in the mathematical realization we'll work with. Okay. Was there another question? I saw someone hop up for a sec. All right, and maybe just another general comment. So one reason that these Coulomb branches are of interest from a mathematical point of view is that it has turned out that there's a, a very wide array of examples of objects that were already of interest to mathematicians in geometry and Lie theory that have that turn out to be um, describable as the Coulomb branches of different um, different kinds of quantum field theory, and indeed the results of this talk will be another uh, example of that general principle. And this has been a very fruitful and powerful connection in terms of uh, providing new perspectives, generating new conjectures, and realizing uh, and suggesting new connections among you know many mathematical objects kind of uh, you know uh, that are interesting again purely from the the point of view of a mathematician and this quantization is a quantization over not over formal power series but over polynomials in h bar exactly so this will be a real it'll be a uh, so this will be an algebra over polynomials in h bar okay All right. So as, uh, yeah, so the specific key, so I'll kind of narrow in on the, the class of theories that um, will be directly relevant to us. So uh, if I fix uh, the data, so now I'll let G be a general complex reductive group, and I'll fix the data of a complex represent, finite dimensional complex representation of G, I'll call that N, um, to this data is associated a, a 3D N equals 4 gauge theory, which I write as TGN. Maybe more invariantly, this is really associated to N plus N dual, but um, nonetheless, I'll write it this way. Uh, and for this class of 3D N equals 4 theories, uh, Braverman, Finkelberg, and Nakajima introduced a, a formulation of the Coulomb branch in terms of geometric representation theory. Or you might, you, this could also, for practical purposes, 
this will be our mathematical definition of what a Coulomb branch is and what a quantized Coulomb branch is. And in their definition, this quantized Coulomb branch algebra, it's a certain equivariant borel moore homology um, ring. So here, G sub O, that's going to denote the arc group of G, so the group of uh, formal power series valued in G. And I can take the semi-direct product with C star, where C star acts by scaling this variable T. And that group acts on a space that they introduced, um, notated RGN. So this is some large infinite dimensional space which lives over the affine Grismanian of G. So here, recall the affine Grismanian of G that I'll write as Kerr sub G. This is the quotient of G sub K, which is the formal loop group of G, the, space, the group of G valued formal power series by the subgroup G sub O. And uh, this uh, C star action is responsible for H bar in the answer. Yes, yeah, exactly. So yeah, thank you. Geometrically, uh, yeah, so I've said that this um, quantized coordinate ring is this equivariant homology, and that in particular, because this is some equivariant homology with that C star acting, this will naturally be an algebra over the equivariant homology of C star, and I'll write H bar for the generator of that, um, and that's polynomials in H bar. Um, and so in particular, this C star, this loop rotation C star also acts on the affine Grismanian. Um, so RGN lives over the Grismanian. So it's some intersection of vector bundles. Let me just describe explicitly what the fibers are. So if I pick an element little g of the loop group, so then that gives me uh, a point brackets g in the Grismanian. Then the fiber over this space, the fiber of RGN over that point is the following. I look at n sub o, so that is n valued formal power series. That's a, a linear subspace of n sub k, n valued formal Laurent series. n sub k has an action of g sub k. So I can take my element little g, I can act on n, it acts, uh, it gives me an automorphism of n sub k. And it takes this subspace n sub o to some other subspace g times n sub o. And now I take the intersection of those two subspaces. Now I have a smaller subspace of n sub k, and that's the fiber of this map over little g. Yeah, it's OK, but it's a bit too abstract for those who see it first time. So k is, ah. a, is a field of Laurent series. Yeah, this mm -hmm. is clear. Uh, but uh, for uh, g, for example, uh, I don't know. Yeah, let me... Um, no, SLN, it's just some sort of simple thing. It's like a lattices in the standard. Yeah, good. Thank, thank you. Let me uh, let me write this out explicitly in the lattice model. So for, um, let's say for GER, I take the Grossmannian of GER GLN. This is equivalently the space or it's set of C points. It's the set of uh, lattices L in um, CN sub K, so CN valued Laurent series. So recall being a lattice means that um, it's preserved by T. And it should be kind of not too far from the standard lattice of CN valued power series. So there should be some power. So for sufficiently large N, uh, I should have, let me write L naught. For CN valued Laurent series, or power series, sorry. Um, then I should have that T to the minus N uh, L naught, let's see, will contain L, and then L will in turn contain T to the plus N, L naught for N sufficiently large. So this is some way of saying it's not too far away from, it differs by a fun, kind of finite dimensional amount from the standard lattice. So this is, um, you know, this is now something that really resembles a Grossmannian. It's some space of linear subspaces of another, uh, linear space. So there's GER GLN. And then what is the space R? If I now look at, take N to be just the, the defining representation of GLN. 
and I consider this space R is R G O N comma C N. All right, so this is some space over GER G L N. So certainly the data of a point in this space R should include the data of a point in the Grassmannian. So it just should include points of this space should in particular parameterize uh, lattices. And then the additional data of a point in the fiber is just a date the data of a vector, let me call it S, in the intersection of that lattice with the standard lattice. So it's this kind of, you can, it's another way of saying this, over this infinite dimensional Grassmannian, I have two tautological vector bundles. I have just the, the trivial one where the fibers are the standard lattice, and then I have the tautological bundle of curve GLN, where the fiber is given by, you know, the fiber at a point is the lattice, which is named by that point. And now I'm taking the intersection of those two tautological bundles, and that's what this space R is. And then this, you know, and now this formula here is just some generalization where now N can be any representation of GLN. So can I understand this uh, RG uh, N as a sort of uh, similar to Sprunger resolution of the Grassmannian? Yeah, that's exactly right. So, with, yeah, or and it's um, yeah, they they call it the the variety of triples in their paper. So it's very much inspired as it you know it's a kind of Steinberg like object. I see. Okay, let's stop work. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and in particular, so let me. I, I haven't written us this out explicitly, and I won't. But there's a convolute. So, for example, when n is zero, it just recovers this just specializes to the Grassmannian itself, and in general, the space inherits a convolution product which generalizes the the convolution product on on the affine Grassmannian, which is obtained in the n equals zero case. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So to zoom in even further on the examples I want to discuss, so a special case um, is so-called quiver gauge theories. So now let me, um, so this is some combinatorial formalism for naming pairs of GNN in the above description. So if I have a quiver Q, so a finite directed graph, and I have a labeling of its vertices by natural numbers, then I can associate to this, uh, or one associates to this, the following pair. So I'll take a group, which is just the product of general linear groups, where the product is uh, over the vertices of the quiver, the size of the rank of the general linear group is, uh, is the integer or the natural number of associated to that vertex. There's a few variations on this for the, the statement that I'll want to give on the next slide. Where I'm not discussing framings for now. And so actually the natural thing will be to take this product of general linear groups and quotient by the C star. Uh, so there, the, of course, the center of each of these GLs is C star. And I can look at the, the C star that's just embedded diagonally into the product of the centers. Um, and this quotient group acts on the sum over the edges of the group at the edges of the quiver of the matrix spaces of size. So if I have a, an edge that goes from V to W, I look at D of V by D of W matrices. Of course, that has a, an action of GL D of V and GL uh, D of W. And then if I take the direct, which is invariant under the, the diagonal uh, of their centers. And now if I take the direct sum over all edges, I have some uh, big sum of matrix spaces that is equipped with an action of this big product of general linear groups. And the associated uh, gauge theory is what we call a, a 3D, is a 3D n equals four quiver gauge theory. All right, so now I've said enough, I can state uh, our first result. Um, it's the following. Uh, so let me let write TN now for the theory, the quiver gauge theory associated to the following quiver. So I look at a quiver that had just a big linear piece um, labeled from one to n minus one. And then I have n leaves hanging off the n minus one node, each of which has a uh, just a one on it. Then the theorem, there's an algebra isomorphism between the ring of differential operators, asymptotic differential operators on SLN mod u and the quantized Coulomb branch of this quiver gauge theory. And moreover, this identifies, so the symmetric group of SLN is SN, 
So that acts via the Gauss von Graiev action on the ring of differential operators. And on the other hand, uh, this quiver gauge theory and the kind of invariance induced from it, so this quantized Coulomb branch, it inherits an action of any symmetries that this labeled quiver has. So there's an evident, of course, SN acts on this quiver by permuting the right-hand vertices. That induces an SN action on this quantized Coulomb branch. And then the theorem is, uh, is that this isomorphism identifies those two symmetric group actions. There are some other cat compatibilities, but the, the symmetric group action is the most interesting one. So the our kind of inspiration for this and a corollary is a, a proposal of Dancer, Hanani, and Kerwan. So they uh, broke down this quiver and they suggested that there should be an algebraic symplectic isomorphism between the, the underlying classical um, Coulomb branch and the affine closure of the cotangent bundle of S on SLN mod U. Uh, so of course, as we said before, uh, if I that's the affine variety whose coordinate ring is obtained from this algebra of differential operators by specializing h bar equal to zero. And there they were had a completely different set of, uh, I mean, they were motivated from a, a different point of view than the way that I've kind of motivated this thing, uh, the way that I've motivated things from representation theory. They had a differential geometric motivation, which was that um, this affine closure of the cotangent bundle of SLN mod U it can be interpreted as the universal hyperkähler implosion of SLN. So this was a, a kind of theory that was developed in prior work, in, in particular Dancer, Kerouan, and Swan. So I won't go really into the, I don't want to say too much about this, but uh, the point is this is a kind of hyperkähler uh, generalization of the earlier theory of symplectic implosions. Uh, and indeed, the the just the base affine space itself and its affine closure play a, were already known to play a universal role in the theory of symplectic implosions. Um, so they were interested in the hyperkähler analog of that. Uh, and they suggest in this paper with Hanani, they suggested, ah, if you look at this, uh, this quiver, that should be, um, it's Coulomb branch should give you a description of this space. They, and they presented, they made some kind of, uh, showed that this passed certain numerical cons consistency checks in terms of um, balanced and unbalanced nodes. And they also uh, observed that when you look at small values of n, actually this isomorphism uh, follows from computations that were already in the literature. So for example, you'll notice if you take n equals three, um, then you actually just get an affine D4 quiver here. It's the kind of quiver that you know people already kind of had thought about computing those Coulomb branches. And this isomorphism follows from uh, kind of computations that people had already done for other reasons. Um, so anyway, so we obtain this, yeah, this um, algebraic symplectic isomorphism falls out of proving the quantized version of this statement. So, um, all right, so there's our first result. And actually we, what we prove is a more general statement than this. So let me formulate, um, to formulate this generalization, let me introduce some more notation. Uh, so I'll write N1 through NK, Let's let this be an ordered tuple of natural numbers whose sum is n. So uh, such tuples are in bijection with functions from e1 through en minus 1 to 0, uh, comma 1. So here, so I, this is a levy, going to be a levy generalization. Um, so notice in the, if you th tr think about what's the group associated to this quiver, well, this, uh, family of univalent nodes over here, the group associated with that is just a, a torus, and it's specifically the maximal torus of the GLN, which is kind of the collection of these matrices, uh, of these edges here, in the representation gives me a, a matrix factor. It's n minus one by n matrices. And this is really the maximal torus of the GLN that's acting on that matrix space. So this will generalization will be about what happens when I replace that torus with a levy uh, in the gauge group. So then this this tuple n one through n k that's going to be the the tuple of the ranks of a block decomposition of a levy. Um, and then this function here, this is just recorded the indicator function of which Chevalier generators are in the Lie algebra of that levy. So uh, under this bijection, so for example, psi being constantly zero that will correspond to the um, 
the partition of all ones that will correspond to, if you just take the maximal torus, none of the Chevrolet generators are in its uh, Lie algebra. And then psi constantly one that will correspond to just the, the partition just given by n itself. In other words, when I take the levy to be all of GLN, then of course, all of the Chevrolet generators are contained in its Lie algebra. All right, so I have this tuple, uh, I have this function psi, and any such psi, it is, extends to uh, a Lie algebra co or sorry, a Lie algebra character of the Lie algebra of u. So in other words, this gives me an element uh, u dual, the dual of Lie algebra of u. Now, what do we do with elements of u dual? Well, the action of u on SLN induces a Hamiltonian action on its cotangent bundle. And so we have the moment map for that Hamiltonian action. So we have a moment map u, which is a function from T star SLN to the dual of the Lie algebra of u. And given a value of the moment map, we have the associated Hamiltonian reduction. So I'll write that as, so if I take the reduction by the moment map value psi, I'll write that as T, T star SLN mod mod u over psi. And that's, uh, that's of course, the pre-image of the moment map value psi uh, quotiented by the action of the group u. And in particular, if I take uh, psi to be zero, then this reduction is just this thing that we already described uh, in the previous slide. It's the affine closure of the cotangent bundle of um, the quotient of the base. So it's T star SLN mod U bar. All right. And so now the generalization of the theorem from the previous slide um, is the following. So now let me write T psi for the theory that's associated to this um, quiver, where now, again, I have this same linear part, but now I have the leaves that I have on the right-hand side are labeled by the, the elements of this uh, ordered partition, or they're labeled by the factors in this ordered partition. Then theorem, there's an isomorphism of algebraic varieties between the Coulomb branch of the theory T psi and the reduction of T star SLN by U at the moment map value psi. This, I, I'm, I'm, this theorem is surely still true at the quantized level. We don't prove that for reasons I'll get to in, in a minute. Um, any questions about the statement? Yes, I do. Uh, the psi, uh, the psi assumes to be the character for the D algebra or mm -hmm. for, for the group, right? Or for the D algebra. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Basically, yes. that's completely determined by the, uh, the value on the simple root, root vectors. That's exactly, because those generate the Lie algebra. So if it's a if it's a Lie algebra character, it's determined by its values uh -huh. on them. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Oh. Actually, I do have a question. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, how, how, how is the, the number of parts K? Is related to to this psi. We define the value from zero to one. Uh, I it will be the number of simple factors in that levy. I see that. That's what uh, I I was uh, imagining. That uh, yeah yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So if k equal to one, you simply have a a n quiver or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, in the, yes, for exactly. the principal principal. Uh, character that k equals one. There is That's exactly that. right. That's exactly right, yeah. Yeah, so in that case, we have the, I'll say more, a, a little bit yeah, more about yeah, this yeah, in a yeah. second. But then of course, that also corresponds to the Whitaker, to a non-degenerate character. Um, yeah, when you say quiver, you mean arrows from left to right? Uh, what? Uh, you're right, I, I yeah, I haven't, drew, the arrows should be oriented. The In these cases, the, the Coulomb, the, the Coulomb will ultimately be insensitive to the choice of orientations, which is why I've omitted it. Huh. So which means that it's not really a quiver, it's sort of a graph. Yeah, ultimately it's just a graph. You you make a choice, You so you can think of the, I mean, you, you can see in the previous page, I, I am, let's see, where did I write this? Yeah, down here, 
I kind of implicitly needed to make some choice to write down this representation, right? Because I had to choose, is it D of V by D of W matrices or D of W by D of V matrices? And then which, um, I, I had to kind of make that some such choice to write down the representation. But as I said earlier, also, you know, this is some somehow more invariantly, this gauge theory is really a gauge theory associated to the cotangent bundle of n or the cotangent one or to the representation n plus n dual. And so this BFN construction, it's a description of a cotangent, the it's a description of the Coulomb branch of uh, a gauge theory which is associated to this um, representation. But the construction, one way of saying it is that the construction itself depends on choosing a Lagrangian in this um, in this in this symplectic representation. So the the construction will depend on that on some splitting. I have this quaternionic representation, and I'm choosing a splitting of it like this, and then carrying out a construction that depends on that choice of splitting. But ultimately, the 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 outcome of the construction will be independent of that choice. Mm -hmm. I see. So this is just the like a Nakajima like quiver variety construction. You, you it, it's exactly the same it, representation it, it, variety, and also it's dual. It's the same, yeah, yeah well, exactly the same kind of thing. So in the the okay. Nakajima variety, we would say is the so called Higgs branch of this gauge theory. Um, mm -hmm. But the kind of invariance that we're discussing, it's the same, um, yeah, it's the same principle. The the gauge theory doesn't depend on the choice of orientations of the you know neither the Higgs nor Coulomb branch will depend on it, even though to write down some construction, you, you might need to make a choice or you might choose to make a choice. Yeah, I noticed that your earlier SL2 example that was the corresponding variety is exactly uh, Nakajima quiver variety, <laughs> deformed one at the edge. All right, okay. Um, yeah, so there's this, there's the statement, our statements. Um, and now, yeah, so now let me finish by just describing some of the kind of key ingredients that we, that we draw on in the literature um, in proving these results. Uh, so one first, so wait, one key ingredient um, is the so-called regular sheaf. So this is the, um, so all right, a reg. So this is, it, this is something that exists in all types of, it's the PGLN version, which is relevant for us. So in the category of perverse, um, perverse, perverse sheaves on the Grassmannian of PGLN, um, I have, there is a, a sheaf that I'll write as a reg, or maybe I should say in perverse sheaves. This will be a kind of big object. Um, this is the object that corresponds to the regular representation of SLN, so the coordinate ring of SLN, under the geometric Satake equivalence. So recall that there's a geometric Satake that's an equivalence of tensor categories between representations in this case of the group SLN uh, and perverse sheaves on the Grassmannian of the Langlands dual, which in this case is PGLN. Um, so I have, so that again, this is a kind of um, important object in representation theory. It's been studied by a number of authors. Uh, a key- so In uh, particular, it should be a ring object with respect to the convolution because yes, uh, in particular, yeah. So since SL, since cornering of SLN is a ring object in the category of SLN representations, this will be a ring object in the Satake category. Um, so the specifically something that we will need about this object is um, a result of Ginsburg Riesch, who explained that the this algebra of differential operators that we discussed before. Can be abstract can be extracted from the regular sheaf. Um, again, this 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 were these they work. This is a type independent result that I'll this, that I'm about to state, but I'll I'll state it just in the type A case, which is what we use. So this algebra of differential operators on SLN mod U, it's the equivariant cohomology of I, I take this regular sheaf. And now I look at the, let me write T check for the maximal torus of, of PGLN. So the Grossmannian of a torus in particular of T check, that's just a discrete set of points. Um, it's the co-character lattice of, of the group. So that, uh, that lattice sits inside 
or PGLN, so I can take this regular sheaf, I can uh, shriek restrict it to this, um, to Gertie check, and now I can take its equivariant cohomology. So specifically, I can take its equivariant cohomology for uh, the group T check sub O, semi-direct C star. Uh, and their result is that recovers this algebra of, um, of differential operators on the base affine space. Um, on the other hand, Braverman, Finkelberg, Nakajima also give us a direct relationship between this regular sheaf and the theory of Coulomb branches. So they show the following. Um, so if you look at this, as we said, this uh, AN quiver, so that you take the, the, the class of quivers from the previous slide and you just look at the, the um, trivial partition just given by N itself. And I write down this uh, linear quiver here. There's an associated space R. That space, as we said, that will live over the affine Grassmannian corresponding to this full product of general linear groups or general linear groups mod C star. But that Grassmannian in turn projects down onto the Grassmannian of just the last of, of any subgroup of that, uh, any quotient group of that. So in particular, it has a projection that kind of big affine Grassmannian has a projection to the Grassmannian of just PGLN, the one corresponding to the, this last node. And I can take the, so recall that originally, how did we get the Coulomb branch? We were taking borel more homology. So we were taking the cohomology of some kind of notion of the dualizing sheaf on that space, which requires some care because of uh, it's an infinite dimensional space. But we're taking something like cohomology of uh, the dualizing sheaf. And before I take cohomology as a kind of intermediate thing, so that's pushing forward to a point, instead I can just push forward to the Grassmannian of PGLN, uh, and there, and a result of theirs is that in fact that just recovers the regular sheaf. Again, when you take the space R associated to this quiver, um, so they carry out that computation and they identify various Coulomb branches related. So, in particular, um, the like this case here of the previous theorem, they the identification of the Coulomb branch in that case already appears in their paper a little bit implicitly. So the Whitaker reduction of uh, T star S of T star a group uh, can also, it's actually, that reduction is actually smooth. And in fact, it's isomorphic to just the group times the constant slice. Um, so that Coulomb branch, um, yeah, they, they compute that Coulomb branch and they compute a kind of even more um, restricted version. So if I, Instead of looking at the quivers that we've looked at, I take this last vertex and I uh, consider as a framed vertex. So again, I kind of describe the quiver gauge formalism in a, in a kind of limited scope, um, in the scope I needed. There's another, there's a kind of extended version of theory where if you see a quiver that has a square vertex, a so-called frame vertex, you, again, with a, a natural number label, you consider the same representation, but I just completely omit the last, the relevant factor of the gauge group. So here, if I look at this quiver with just a box here, uh, I would interpret that as I'm talking about the same underlying vector space, the underlying sum of matrix spaces. But now I just look at the action of the product of the other general linear groups, the ones corresponding to these other uh, circle nodes. So if I look at the, the Coulomb, so the quiver branch of that, um, framed gauge theory, that's the nilpotent cone of SLN. Um, and they had actually, that follows from other computations that they had done in um, a previous paper related to paper on slices in the affine Grassmannian. Um, but you can actually get another kind of proof of that identification um, via, this, um, via this interpretation of the regular sheaf. So you can actually, so the, the, the results that I've been talking about, you can think of as a kind of, um, interpolating between those two results. So um, that this quiver versus the framed version of this quiver, you have the same sum of matrix spaces, but you are looking at either your gauge group includes a whole PGLN, or you just take the trivial subgroup of that PGLN. And then what I've been, you know, the results that we were just discussing are about, well, what if you include instead some factor in a levy subgroup of that PGLN? Is there some explicitly theoretic interpretation of those Coulomb branches. 
and our results are kind of giving, yes, there's an affirmative answer to that. And it's this family related to the base affine space and then these other unipotent reductions. And, and the, our approach is very much an adaptation of the kinds of constructions that they carry out in relation to the nilpotent cone. Um, and so that's, so that's, uh, so we're using these manipulations with the regular sheaf. Uh, and an important, uh, another important ingredient for us is an extension of the work of Ginsburg Riesch, uh, just due to recent work of Mark Maserato. Um, so he proved the kind of levy extension of this uh, Ginsburg Riesch result. So if you look at, um, if I take the regular sheaf, and now I look at the affine Grismanian of a levy uh, subgroup of PGLN. And I again, I take, oh, I guess I, I should actually should not have written here. The, the, so the reason the, res, the result on the previous slide was uh, just about the uh, class, was a classical, not a quantized result, because he doesn't explicitly um, work with the loop equivariance. But if I just take L uh, sub O or L check sub O equivariant cohomology of the restriction to the levy of L, uh, he commute, computes that that provides you with the cotan with the coordinate ring of this unipotent reduction. Um, yeah, so here I I psi is this inclusion of the the associated levy here. Um, yeah, so we um, make crucial use of his his computations in the the in the theorem on the previous slide. All right, well I think that's uh, I think that's all I had to say here. I'm a little bit. Uh, went a little bit fast, but thanks a lot for your attention. Uh, yeah, well, thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, Harold, I have a question. Uh, you know, like this uh, differential operator on on G mod B on the uh, flag, uh, mm -hmm. flag right? It's kind of a more, uh, I don't know, popular or whatever. Anyway, it's related to some, you know, the deep theory of Billinson and Bernstein, as you said, mm -hmm. and you, you, you just uh, so. What should I do uh, with uh, <clears throat> this quantized Coulomb branch if I am interested in in that algebra? In, uh... Um, that that algebra is more. Um, so there's another kind of variation on the same kind of collection of construction. So if so, as I said, if you you can think that the nilpotent cone is related to this. You, you're shriek restricting some, the regular sheaf from PGLN to the identity. Um, uh, yeah, I guess I didn't write that. So Ginsburg Riesch is in turn inspired by earlier work of uh, Arkhipov, Ezra Kopnikov Ginsburg, um, uh, who computed that the coordinate ring on the nilpotent cone is obtained from the regular sheaf by sheaf restricting to the identity point. Now, in between, kind of, in some sense, in between that and looking at the T equivariant cohomology of the restriction to GER T, you could pick, um, say, uh, a direction in the co-character lattice. Uh, so uh, you, some embedding of the natural numbers into the co-character lattice. And you can restrict the regular sheaf to that. Now I have a, a, an n family of points, uh, and take ordinary cohomology, and now I will have some graded ring, um, which will give me a, a resolution of the nilpotent cone. And that's the kind of intermediate construction that would give you. So, in particular, the Springer resolution there. Um, uh, Let's see. Just I don't know if that answers your question or not. <laughs> it partially answers. You say that basically instead of like in in a very very kind of a rough toy model, instead of taking a fine JT quotient, you have full JT quotient. Should mm -hmm. be considered a graded ring, and so in that particular story, this means that you go from the nilpotent cone to its uh, Springer resolution, mm -hmm. which is uh, T star uh, G mod B, and so you quantize it, and so then you get um, differential operators on G mod B. Yeah, but it's sort of, 
formal construction. Yeah, I mean, yeah. What, I should say what, one thing that I, I think is interesting, but we haven't really started to think about yet. I mean, one of the things, what, is, what things do people do with Coulomb branches and quantized Coulomb branches? One of the interesting things that, is that there's a whole paradigm of Kazool duality for um, Coulomb and quantized Coulomb and Higgs branches. Um, so there's a, this ties into the, the more general story of symplectic duality. So um, something that you get from, the, in principle, if you have some some quantum, some non-commutative algebra that you realize as uh, a, a quantized Coulomb branch, that comes with a package of causal duality statements. And potentially, again, we haven't thought about this, but I think it's an interesting kind of... Um, yeah, but do you a, need uh, uh, what? What I'm again confused even of this remark. Uh, uh, I thought that you need sort of uh, 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 differential operators on G mod B, which correspond to the block uh, uh, with a trivial central character in the category O. For that, ah. you can look for the Casual dual. Yeah, um, like I, I, I don't know how this. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, I don't have a, uh, yeah. Um, I mean, one thing to say, I, as I said, depending on how you think, you can prove Balance and Bernstein localization, which is of course about D of G mod B. Uh, you can prove that in way, there are proofs, there are a number of proofs of, of that theorem, uh, but some of them will pass through D of G mod U and I forget in in such proofs, you know, the point is that you wind up identifying D of G mod U with with some with the category with the kind of more algebraic category, which is related to representations of the Lie algebra, but some kind of it. I, I think this is an accurate way that you can think about it. Is I mean, D of G mod B is related to representations of the Lie algebra, or you know, block of that, um, and then D of G mod U is. There's again an algebraic interpretation, which I, I forget exactly what the right words are offhand, but some kind of decorated or enhanced versions of representations of the Lie algebra. Um, yeah, also, yeah, also I have a question about this uh, mm, mm, VL group action, which mm -hmm. is a symmetric group, uh, because your kind of uh, your proof uh, mm, mm, is sort of not quite explicit. I mean, uh, ah. so the manifest action of the symmetric group, you just permute. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and I should say, again, that factor, that proof, again, kind of, uh, the, it, it kind of factors through the description. So in ginsburg Riesch, they, uh, yeah, so they prove this isomorphism and you will notice that one way of saying it is that you can think about rather than uh, shriek restrict into Gertie check or I can think of Gertie check um, that of course has an action a bigger action than this it has an action by T check O semi-direct the vial group um, semi-direct C star um, and so they in their theorem they also so they connect this algebra to the geometry of GERP PGLN and the regular sheaf, but they also connect the Gelfand Graev action. So they show that the action you get here corresponds to the action on this equivariant cohomology that you get by taking equivariant cohomology for that larger for the semi-direct product with the vial group. Um, so that gives you already the the connection of how does the Gelfand Graev action come from the geometry of PGLN? Well, it comes from the action of the vial group on this, on Gertie check. And that in turn, if you, and then kind of the the appearance of Graf von Graf in R theorem just comes from following that interpretation through the rest of the kind of Coulomb construction. So in particular, you'll notice that comes from an action on uh, the Grossmannian of T check, but that T check is kind of the Grassmannian of this these one leaves in the quiver that had those leaves. So that's the the path by which you kind of 
Ginsburg and Reese tell you how golf and grab relates to here. And then if you track that through the Coulomb branch construction, it corresponds to this permutation action on those, um, those univalent leaves. Okay, so interesting. Uh, all right, uh, more questions? Yes. Um, so you look at this, what, what you talked was just the type A for the general linear uh, SRN. Uh, I'm sure I want to ask about the uh, whole yeah, 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 no, that's great. Yeah, groups. thank you for the question. I, I should have, uh, I forgot to mention that. Um, so the expectation, so, uh -huh. the, so and the, you, 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 have, you have this uh, quiver corresponding for the, um, it's not the quiver for the SR, uh, you have a, uh, yes, it is the quiver from one up to mm -hmm. minus one, then you have this uh, kind of a, uh, spread out with the uh, which corresponded to levy factors that's right so the, the so key in case is a type of d or uh, yeah, yeah. D or so d. fundamentally why do we why is it a type a theorem um mm -hmm. it, it's because this computation is the the bfn computation they prove this identification of the regular sheath in um in type a uh, the, okay the other kind of ingredients on this slide those are general type results but this is really a type a thing Part of mm -hmm. that is just oh, yeah. that you know they performed a computation in type A and they you know uh, that was hard. So part of that is just what did they compute? Uh, part of that is so the expectation is that in some so this should not be a fully like the the existence of this isomorphism should not be a fully type independent fact. So I believe that the expectation is that in type for orthogonal types, mm -hmm. there should be a similar statement where there's a, a some gauge theory um, such that the, the regular sheaf arises via the push forward of the dualizing sheaf of the space associated with that gauge theory. Already mm -hmm. that probably takes some, um, I think even in those cases, it's not quite in this framework of gauge theories of cotangent type, which again, so I'd already alluded to kind of we're talking about mm -hmm. when I write TGN, it's a kind of shorthand for a, a theory that's really associated to this, this, this is a represent, so this is a quaternionic vector space with an action of G. Mm -hmm. And more generally, one has a 3D N equals for a gauge theory associated to a quaternionic representation of G, even if it does not have, so not all such representations will have a splitting like this. So the original BFN construction gives you a construction of the Coulomb branch for a gauge theory where you have such a splitting, but you can consider gauge theories for uh, uh, coming from other quaternionic representations. And now they're actually in subsequent work of, um, gosh, I, I potentially going to forget all the authors offhand, but Braverman, Finkelberg, Dillon, Raskin, uh, and maybe there's another author, I, for, I apologize, I'm, I'm forgetting. They subsequently gave a description of the Coulomb branch, even for a general quaternionic representation. Um, so it's uh, it's possible that in, in light of that result and in light of other techniques that have appeared since BFN's original um, work here, um, it's possible that now enough techniques exist to prove the analog of this theorem. Again, I think you expect that to be true for orthogonal types. And given this theorem, then kind of everything else is in place for there to be some extension of the kind of, you know, this, the family of um, extensions that I was discussing. Um, all the other ingredients go forth to other types. And then once you go beyond um, orthogonal types, there's it gets into kind of even murkier territory where you expect, I, I think the correct thing to say is that there should, there will be some 3D N equals four QFT, which will no longer be a gauge theory, but some kind of more exotic kind of QFT, such that nonetheless, the associated ring object um, will give rise to the regular sheaf via the same mechanism. But then you're even outside the realm of 3D uh, gauge theories and I'm not even sure if that point at that point if there would be a clear formulation 
of the kinds of generalizations of the kinds of you know results mm -hmm. I was taking here because these are you know my results are all in their statement the statements involve mentioning the gauge group and changing the gauge group so once there's no longer a gauge group I don't really know um, yeah here I, you, 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 say in the quivers in, in the quiver setting the gauge group is always the general linear group or, or quotient so. yeah so, the product of general linear groups mm -hmm. and the type A is heavily based on that part am I right yeah sorry say again and because here because the type A and because of this time the gauge group is just the product of the uh, general linear groups mm -hmm. um, and in the specific case that uh, you have this frame the type A uh, quiver you have this mm -hmm. k, k additional nodes and assume that uh, each mm -hmm. that will give you some kind of a dimension that uh, help you to single out this levy sub uh, levy factor and that uh, mm -hmm. I didn't see how this, uh, how the corresponding variety when you, you, you take the dimension at all earlier vertices from one up to n minus one. Uh, I take the do, um, you, you need to have a vector spaces to set up some geometric uh, yes. stuff. It, that's right. So the the numbers are the dimensions of vector spaces at those vertices. More yes, or I'd say, I'd say more directly, they're the ranks of some general linear groups, and then um, okay, so the, yeah. the, that's also corresponding to the and uh, so the, from a smaller number to a larger number, you really want the vector space to be in quotient, correspond to the, the, the quiver. Or... Well, well, it's for every edge here, so the mm -hmm. I don't necessarily care about the relationship between. There's no constraint on the numbers at either end of an edge. They just tell me this edge is going to label some, you know, like that edge. That's right. That's the matrix. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right. See. And so, then, you know, the, it's there's nothing particular obvious about why, you know, this part of the quiver should be what it is. It's just that's the recipe that um, turns out to be the right recipe. Because as far as I remember, then Nakajima was taking this uh, Hamiltonian reduction. He has to take some stable objects in the fiber. It's not uh, a Nakajima quiver variety. It's different construction. This is a different uh, quiver variety. Is a mirror dual. It's yeah. It, it's it's different though. It, I, I mean, a particular. Uh, it's worth noting uh, in the case where you do this framed. So if you if you take uh, this framed quiver here. This mm -hmm. this one would, one would say that this is self mirror. So in this special case, actually the Higgs and Coulomb branches are the are the same. Uh -huh. um, so there's a kind of confluence of the Coulomb story and the quiver variety story. In general, they're kind of distinct classes, but there's some overlap. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, 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 Harold, uh, in the mirror dual to this theory is also a quiver theory. That's a, I th I think it for, I I think in the generality of this picture, I don't know, and I'm I'm, I'm not sure one should necessarily expect that. I believe for this. Another kind of point of view, so uh, yeah, here a uh, kind of picture I learned from Tudor. Uh, so again, the the framed quiver, that's a, a self mirror quiver when I have just a box. Um, and a kind of separate description again of this T star SLN mod U bar is you do some variant of the quiver a kind of variant of the quiver construction where now, you know, I gave some description where uh, um, where I had, there were GL groups at all of the, the nodes, but you can consider, you know, a variant where instead you look at SLs or physically SUs for each of the nodes. So in other words, you take this the same representation, but now you restrict your gauge group to the, product of SLs. 
Um, so that group has a residual. So when you look at the theory, I'm probably going to say the exact words wrong, but that group, that gauge theory has a residual flavor symmetry by the, uh, you know, by the a C star at each of those nodes. And there's a, a kind of mirror symmet, there's an understanding in 3D mirror symmetry of how kind of ungaging those C star factors should work in the mirror. And it makes sense that on the, yeah, so the, this kind of linear, the, ver the, the framed quiver, but where you restrict to SLs, um, the Higgs branch of that is, is, an, is known to give you th this affine closure. And it's kind of known that the mirror construction to removing those gauge groups is, uh, is gauging some things on the other side. So there's some logic, mirror symmetric logic to where uh, this description of this variety as a kind of Nakajima variety Higgs branch for the SLs should be mirrored to some description like this, where now I've turned on some extra C star factors. So I think yeah, in that for case- each, For each, for each vertex, yeah, because you have SU at yeah. each vertex, not just overall C star as you did previously. That's right, that, yeah, yeah. So th there's, um, so I think the mirror to this can be under is gonna be some gauge theory and there's a nice mirror story. But once you have these, I don't think there's even at the physical level an understanding of kind of what's the mirror to turning on these these now non-abelian factors over here. So mm -hmm. we took the self-mirror theory, but now we've turned on some non-abelian gauge symmetry. What should that do to the mirror side? I don't I don't believe there's a systematic understanding of um, what that should do. So in particular, I am not sure there's a clear picture of what the, but is there, the mirror is there... theory to this should be. Is there maybe geometric, some kind of, you see like for this Sicilian theories, uh, mm -hmm. one, one side is quiver and the other, way, the other one is pure geometric, like, uh, so then. Yeah, yeah, but I think the Sicilian theories are a little more special, right? Because they're all the legs are the same. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's yeah. star-shaped, yes. Yeah. Yeah. But nevertheless, just kind of. Philosophy. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe I mean it seems plausible, but I don't know a precise kind of uh, uh, guess to venture. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, more questions. Well, if not, let uh, thank Harold for very interesting talk. Thank you very much. Great. Well, thank you again. And this is it for today.